Here on this table next to me, I have a variety of different subwoofers. Now let's say I'm going to install a new system into my car or into my home, and I'm trying to decide between two different 12 inch subwoofers. Let's say that both of those subwoofers are 12 inches in size and they're both rated at 500 watts RMS. With the same size and the same power rating, how can I possibly know which of these two subwoofers is better for my application? Well, if you've ever looked at a manual for a subwoofer or for speakers, you've probably seen all of these different numbers. These are Tele small parameters or TS parameters. But what in the world do they mean? TS parameters are a set of electromechanical specifications for speakers. In basic terms, they allow us to define the performance of a speaker or subwoofer, which allows us to then compare subwoofers and speakers against one another. If we understand these parameters and what each number means, we can pick the speaker or subwoofer that's best for our home or car audio system. So in this video, we're gonna cover exactly what each of these numbers mean so that you can select the speaker or subwoofer that's perfect for your needs. Hey guys, Mark here with Car Audio Fabrication. Here on this channel, I do car audio reviews, build log videos, and tutorial videos, just like this one. So if you are new here, I would love to have you as a subscriber. So let's jump into Tele small parameters. So let's start off with FS, which is free air resonance. So we know with the subwoofer that the cone and the surround and the voice coil and the spider all move in and out. The frequency at which all of these moving parts resonate is called the FS, or resonant frequency. In basic terms, this is the frequency at which everything vibrates most efficiently. The free air resonance of a speaker or subwoofer is determined by the mass of all the moving parts and the compliance of that speaker or subwoofer. Now, as I go through these different values, I'm going to explain to you guys a general rule of thumb, and it's important to understand that these are just general rules of thumb. It doesn't mean that these rules of thumb are hard and fast rules that can't be broken. They're just more or less guidelines. So in this case with free air resonance, the general rule of thumb is that it becomes more and more difficult to reproduce frequencies below the speaker's FS. Now it's also important to note that once we put a speaker into a speaker enclosure that we're actually going to change the resonant frequency of that system. This is of course where box tuning comes into effect. Moving on, we next have the Q parameters. And the Q parameters are often the most misunderstood and really actually kind of the hardest to understand parameters of a speaker. The Q parameters are basically the quality of damping. They're unitless, but the best way to kind of think about them is kind of like a spring. Damping is the resistance to motion, so in a spring, the strength of the spring could be seen as its Q factor or its resistance to compression or stretching. So the first Q factor is QMS. This is mechanical damping, and it's controlled by the surround of the speaker and the spider. Electrical damping, on the other hand, is called QES. This comes from the coil and the magnet because as the coil moves through the magnetic field, it creates an electrical current that actually creates an opposition to the flow of that movement. Finally, we have QTS, which is simply a value that's determined based on the QES and QMS of a speaker. So what can be really helpful about the QTS value is you can use it to determine a good guideline for what type of subwoofer enclosure you should use. Again, this is just a guideline, not a strict rule, but a QTS below 0.4 is generally good for a ported enclosure. Anywhere from 0.4 to 0.7 is great for a sealed enclosure, and above a 0.7 is great for a free air or infinite baffle type application. Now it's also important to note once again that once we put the speaker into an enclosure, we're going to change the Q values. That's because the air inside the enclosure will actually help to assist in dampening the movement of the cone. So this is why it's important to have a great box design. Now I'm totally going to drop a shameless plug on you, but if you're interested in a custom subwoofer box design, I do them through my website, caraudiofabrication.com. Check it out down below. So next up we have VAS, and this is a unit of volume. Yeah dude, volume, crank it up. Not that kind of volume, but rather the amount of air that is equal to the compliance of the subwoofer's cone movement. 
So in a way, this is related to CMS, which is the next parameter that we'll talk about. To measure VAS, you really have to have perfect laboratory conditions as the humidity and temperature of air can affect this measurement. And honestly, it's not really a parameter that we can really use to look at the performance of the speaker. So let's move on to CMS, which is measured in meters per Newton. CMS is the compliance of the speaker or the stiffness of the cone movement. This is driven by the suspension components like the spider and the surround. If the speaker movement is very stiff, that means it will have a low compliance for CMS. If it is high, the speaker will have more of a loose suspension. The measurement of these values also affects the resonant frequency of the subwoofer. So as compliance goes up, or in other words, the speaker accepts movement more, the resonant frequency is generally going to go down. Think about it this way. If you have a spring with a weight attached at the bottom, and it's a soft spring, and you pull that weight and you let go, it's going to vibrate at a lower frequency. Whereas if you have a much stiffer spring, or in other words, a speaker that's not as compliant, and you pull that same weight and let go again, this time it's going to vibrate at a much higher frequency. So having an understanding of the compliance of the subwoofer can allow you to know whether the subwoofer is more prone to easily accepting movement or to stopping on a dime after having electrical input. Our next parameter is RE. This is the DC resistance of the voice coil. So we can actually measure this in real time here if we take a digital multimeter and we set it to measure resistance, which is measured in ohms. So a lot of times when people measure this value, they get worried. They think that something's wrong with their subwoofer or speaker because almost always that measurement is going to be lower than what's considered the nominal impedance of the speaker. Nominal impedance and the RE or DC resistance are not the same thing. Speaker manufacturers are going to advertise the nominal impedance as that's generally the impedance the amplifier is going to see while you're using that speaker or subwoofer. Now, as a quick side note, near the resonant frequency of the subwoofer, the subwoofer is going to need much more power to move because of a spike in the impedance. But this is balanced out by the fact that the speaker will move more easily at its resonant frequency. The whole reason that we see this spike in impedance at the resonant frequency and a spike as you go in the higher range of frequencies for a particular subwoofer or speaker is because of the inductance of the voice coil. And this leads to the next parameter, which is LE, which is measured in millihenries. You see, when we apply current to a voice coil in a subwoofer or speaker, we're also going to get a current flow in the opposite direction, which is called electromotive force, or EMF. That is part of the reason why we do see that spike in impedance near the resonant frequency and as we go to the upper frequency range of that particular sub or speaker. Now you may have also heard the term motor strength. The parameter for motor strength is called BL and it's measured in Tesla meters. So in really basic terms, this is the strength of the actual motor or the magnet in relationship to the voice coil in moving the speaker back and forth. Now this is a 10 inch subwoofer. If we went to a 12 inch subwoofer, we would likely need a stronger motor in order to move the cone structure. So it's hard to compare motor strength between subwoofers from size to size. But if you're looking at a manufacturer and you're looking at a couple of their different product lines, and let's say you know that you want to go with a 10 inch subwoofer, you can easily compare the motor strength from one 10 inch subwoofer to another 10 inch subwoofer. The BL is a good indicator of how quickly the speaker will react to input. But that's also kind of a generalization because it does have to overcome the stiffness of the design of the subwoofer and speaker. Next up we have no, not MMMs, but rather MMS and MMD, and I see a lot of times that these two get confused. So a lot of times you'll see this measured in grams because these two parameters relate to mass. So MMD is the mass of all of the moving parts. So in other words, the mass of the cone, the mass of the voice coil, half of the mass of the surround, and half of the mass of the spider. Now MMS is the same mass as all those things, plus the mass of the air that is moving. So generally speaking, the higher the mass of all these things, so the higher the MMS, the lower the resonant frequency of the subwoofer. 
Again, we'll go back to the explanation of using a spring. Imagine you have a spring with a large weight or a large mass and you pull it and vibrate it, it's gonna be more prone to have a slow resonant frequency. Whereas if you have a light mass or a light cone structure and all these other components, it's going to vibrate more quickly because it's going to be able to move more quickly. So how does this relate to real world? Well, a lighter MMS can relate to a faster moving, more punchy speaker, or a heavier MMS can help bring the resonant frequency down. Now let's talk about SD. This is an important parameter that I feel like a lot of people don't give enough attention. SD is the area of the cone. SD is a parameter that's important to take into account if you want to determine how much air a subwoofer can actually move. Now you would think if you compared one 10 inch subwoofer to another 10 inch subwoofer, you would think that they would have the same area, but they don't because the cone design can be different where if it's a deeper cone, if you think about it, that's actually more area and more contact with air that it can move. Now another important variable that has a relationship to SD is actually the X max or how far the cone will move because that also has an impact on how much air you're going to move. To explain X max, I'd rather draw something for you. So I've come up with a little diagram here for you guys to explain X max. I want you to imagine that we've cut a speaker in half and this here is the cone of the speaker or subwoofer. And this here is one of the poles. You'd also have a pole in here, which is the magnet. And then here we have the voice coil, which is basically a cylinder and it has all of the wire wrapped around it. This wire that's wrapped around it is what's connected to the speaker terminals. So when you put AC current, through these wires, what happens is the voice coil moves in and out and thus moves the speaker cone. Now what's important to understand here is how many windings of the speaker are within this distance here. You can see that as we move up, there's the same number of windings in this distance. As we move up even more, same number of windings. But once we move past this point, all of a sudden we're reducing the amount of windings that are in this distance. When this happens, we're going to get distortion. The same goes for when we move the other direction. We have the same number of windings, same number of windings, same number of windings, all of a sudden, nope, not anymore, distortion. So what Xmax is, is when we're at this resting state, in other words, there's no power applied to the speaker, Xmax is this distance right here. It's the distance that the voice coil can move until we don't have the same number of windings within the gap. Now the parameter SPL is one that I know gets a lot of attention, but people have a common misconception about this. SPL is not the max output that a speaker could have. You could have a subwoofer that has an SPL of 90 and you're gonna easily get over 90 decibels. What SPL means is the manufacturer will take their subwoofer or speaker and they'll input one watt of power and they measure the SPL reading at that one watt of power. What this then tells you is how efficient a speaker is on that one watt of power. Now different manufacturers will measure SPL in different ways, so it's hard to compare between different manufacturers, but if you had one company and you were looking at their different product lines, you could easily see which speakers are more efficient than others. So looking at the SPL will help you make a good comparison between different subwoofers and help you make a better choice. Now I know in this video I was talking a lot about the surround and the cone and the voice coil, and something I'd really like to do is a video about the anatomy of a subwoofer. If that's something that you guys would like to see, let me know by posting a comment down below. If you're new here, I wanted to let you know that I also have what I think is a really good video explaining crossovers how you can determine where to set your crossovers, what they even are, what they're useful for, and how you can use them to make your sound system sound amazing. If you'd like to check out that video, I'll put it here on screen as a related video. And again, if you're new here, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. A special thanks goes out to Brian, Ali, EJ, Emmanuel, Rory, Truman, and Jerry, and the rest of the Patreon support team. Thank you guys so much for helping support the making of these videos. As always, my Fabrication family, thank you for watching.